This robot is 95% 3D printed. It has no aluminum chassis, drivetrain, and in fact, apart from some bearings and fasteners and drawer slides from a local hardware store, the entire thing is made out of plastic. And it's really impressive seeing so much of this being 3D printed. Do you have an aluminum substructure for your drivetrain? No, no, it's no, fully 3D printed. Fully 3D printed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like about 90% of the robot is 3D printed. Yeah. Seeing a team compete at this level with a fully printed robot is incredibly rare and it shows what's possible when you rethink your approach to materials and design and within some strict budget constraints. By watching this breakdown, you'll see exactly how to build competitive robots using these methods, giving you principles you can apply in your own builds in the future. In this episode of Robots Revealed, I'm sitting out with team 16055 Starbots from Brazil to go through their robot from the Into the Deep season. We'll cover their game strategy, their unique turret intake, hang mechanism, and get up close and personal with all their custom parts. My name is Coach Pratt. As a coach to national champion FTC teams and a robotics and design educator for over a decade, I can tell you that this is one of the most innovative robots that I've seen all season. Let's get into it. Tell me about your general strategy for the season. What was your approach? Our approach for this season is to be specialized in doing the scoring on the, the chambers yeah, yeah. and also doing the specimens as efficiently as possible. And for the, the autonomous period, we want to do four of the specimens. Yes. And until I operate it around uh, 10 or 8, it depends yes, according definitely. to the match. Yeah, so that's the quick overview of our strategy. And now uh, for the robot. Yeah. Let's we'll have take two, a look at the intake. We have two two main devices to it, two mechanisms. One is on the tip of the claw, which we call it the adaptive claw, which is a system that is responsible for collecting the sample by the feature of it. Yeah. So it, it like we can be sure, assured that it's like has a perfect grip on the insides of the sample. And also to be able to collect the sample anywhere that it might be on the arena and also to make the process more easy for us, we have the self-adjusting wrist, which is a mechanism that is both active and passive. And the active mechanisms help us to really secure it on the right position. And also the wristbands that we have, which is the passive one, it helps the claw to always stick back to the correct position and make it more efficient as possible. Uh, so that's like a, a self-centering point then. Yeah, so exactly. that it always comes back. Exactly. So here like we position for like scoring so yep. we can grab the sample. Yep. And here it just like go back to the exact position so we can... That you need transfer. for your scoring yes. position. That's really slick. I like that. <laughs> Yeah. So, after the sample is secured on the intake, we start the transfer system. So, the call retracts to the insides of the robot, and then the outtake takes action. So, we have now, the outtake. Before we go into the mm, outtake, yeah? okay. I'm curious why you use such a large ball bearing. It's almost like um, a ring bearing. It has a lot to do with the overall design, and also... When we did a resistant analysis on the intake system, we discovered that if we had a, a bigger one, larger one, it would increase its durability. Yeah. So for us, this is a major, a good point for us to have on the robot, because as you can see, it's mainly 3D printed. Yeah. So we have to really uh, embrace everything that we could do to enhance the endurance of it. And do you have a limelight on the front yes. of this? Okay. Yeah. We're going to talk about the automation later. Yep. No, <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. let's talk about your outtake then. So this brings it up. So this brings it up, and then the outtake comes and can collect using those two claws. And with it, we are also able to angulate the outtake to be able to efficiently place in either the baskets or the chambers. And this is an over-center linkage you use to accomplish yeah. that? Exactly. And also, uh, this process is actually like fully automated, so the driver doesn't need to worry about getting those specific angles doing this transfer itself. So it's only done with one button. Yeah. And also, like a quick overview of the system of the robot, we have the slight systems that can adapt to both, like reaching the basket, the high basket, and also the uh, horizontal one that can adapt to get to the end of the submersible zones. And uh, climb. Oh, yeah. And also, we are able to climb. Right now, we are only climbing up to the second ascent yeah. okay. because that is more efficient for us and less time consuming. And, and that it's is just these passive plan. hooks. You go all the way up to the exactly. top bar. And then climb with the robot. Yeah. How high up do you pick yourself off of the floor? Just uh, maybe a few centimeters? Just enough no, to get points? No, we are able yeah. to fully like uh, pick yeah. it up. So like it is fully protected. So like okay. it goes like this. Reaching up and like this, all of this, mm, just lifting yeah. up on the basket, mm -hmm. the chain, mm -hmm. the lift. And 
talking about now the automation of this yeah. and all these systems, it works like completely automatically. So for example, we have a lot of sensors working on a robot so we can have like the best result as possible. So it always starts with the limelight that you just said. So we have the limelight and it creates the data of the angle of the sample and it sends to the, the motor in the wrist. So we can angulate and collect the samples automatically. After that, we have the color samples, the sample that the, the color sensor that detects the color of the sample and can, based on that, is going to choose what you do. So for example, if it grabs a yellow sample, it yeah. automatically transfers to the outtake clock. Do you have any sort of uh, lights that show up? You've clearly got LED leads or yeah, LEDs. Yeah, so we're going to get there okay. too. Yeah. yeah. We have the color sensor. So, for example, if it's yellow, it transfers automatically. But if it's the alliance, the, the color of the alliance, it doesn't transfer because it needs to give it to the human player. So it knows what it needs to do. And when it transfers, and all the movement of the outtake and intake happens automatically. So, for example, we're going to. to punctuate in the basket, the driver does, uh, doesn't need to think about all these movements. The driver just press a button and the transfer system occurs like completely and automatically. And something that is really fun, it's also um, happening while the robot is moving. So the driver can po position the robot in the correct position for the basket and the system can run at the same time. We also have, for example, the encoders and the motors to control the slide systems. Yep. And we also have like limit switches used as a safe to measure too. So it doesn't like break anything. Could we pull the intake out so we can see inside yeah. your wiring? Because you guys are so compact in there. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Really yeah, one slick. of the things we wanted was really having a compact yeah. robot. Yeah. So every system needed to fit in this space. You can show yeah. the limited. You've you clearly put a ton of effort into that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Like the battery yeah. goes right here. Yeah, that's insane. How long does it take you to diagnose a problem if something goes wrong in there? Is it is it quite maintainable or is it a bit of a, oh, it's a nightmare to maintain oh, no. this? You know, actually, like, as you can yeah. see, it's pretty robust and also pretty compact. So to be able to identify possible risks yeah. before yeah, yeah. any tournament, actually, we do have a different mail where we like yeah. analysis everything that could possibly happen wrong yeah. before the tournament. Yeah. So we have some preventive uh, measurements for it. Okay, so for you example, do some risk yeah. analysis. Yeah, before, yeah exactly. Right? Yeah. So for example, if we identify that there's a risk of the robot of something breaking, we do a resistance analysis on that specific part. We bring our spare parts to the tournament too. But yeah. also, we have this maintenance plan that we do throughout every mm. single match. So yeah. there are some systems that we need to check before each match. But also, some that we need to check every like five, five matches, ten yeah. matches, just to make yeah. sure that everything's okay. Yeah, exactly. I love it. It's almost a bit like a Formula One pit crew. You uh, know kinda, what yeah. you need to do before you start. Yeah. And talking about the lab that you just said, um, it is used like it was, it is, and it was used in two ways. So the first one, you use it during the creation of the code. So, for example, when we're creating the transfer systems, we needed to put like every movement in a sequence. And sometimes something was getting wrong and you didn't know exactly what movement was getting wrong because the code just stopped it. And so we could like know exactly what in the code was getting wrong. We used to change the color of the LED strips by each line of the code. So when we get stopped it, we could just check the color and see yeah. the code exactly where is the error. So love it. Really lo it's uh, a debug tool and it's also yes, a drive exactly. it's, it's, it's tool. Debug. Can we look at the bottom of your robot? I'm curious yes. if you're using for anything yeah. pro odometry or... Yes, of course. And the last thing, you use the LED strips as a communication between the driver yep. in a match. So, for example, if the transfer system for somehow and um, stop it is going to communicate to the driver, so it doesn't need to like really be like looking exactly and have like clear clear vision because the LED strips will indicate it very clear. So here we have like our automatic frauds. Is a QSM automatic frauds that our team yep. um, developed because and um, this one have like three and. Um, Anyway, yeah, I don't know the names. Like, you have three parts that fix the encoder so, like, it doesn't yeah. move any movement in any position, just the one that we want. Now, and we have it for each. You've clearly, is this support structure that's up at the top, or is there supposed to be a plate that sits on top of that? Uh, no, actually, like, we don't need it because, oh, yeah. So, like, for implementing the custom LMG pods on our robot, actually, we have kind of a little chamber inside the drive frame where, like, we connect it by kind of like we screw it on yeah. so we don't have to really worry about anything like falling off during the match and also another thing that we have on these custom pods is the springs that actually make sure that it's always reaching yeah. the ground 
like this. So it kind so, of like a suspension system. Tell me, what are you most proud of about this robot? What are you happiest with? Oh, like, like the okay. Uh, <laughs> uh-huh. so it's a system. Yeah. Yes, I think. It is. So, like for us, a thing that is, makes us really proud to be able to tell that oh, we did that was actually like the full trust system. Yes, cause, because uh, oh, okay, say, yeah, because like it was only like we didn't get to this final version by nothing. We did have a, like a great like evolution. So, for example, this one was the first idea that we have. The beginning of the season, in the scrim event that we went to, and it just like was getting like we did we did like upgrade it a lot and have to do a lot of a lot of like analysis. Need to think a lot, and the little space that we had was really a problem. So, being able to create this system, like this complexity systems that we have right now, is really something really cool and really that is really I'm really proud of it. Yeah, and it's really impressive seeing so much of this being 3D printed. Do you have an aluminum substructure for your drivetrain? No, it's no, fully, no, it's 3D, all printed. fully 3D printed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like about ninety percent of the robot is 3D printed. Yeah. It also has a lot to do with what the team's uh, is used to use. Yeah. So, like our team has been using 3D printing for like previous like five years now yeah. or more, and like we got really used to do it because also we allow us to have a much creative freedom doing yeah, the process perfect. of developing the robot. Yep. Yeah. Well, this is super cool, you guys. Thank you so much for sharing. You should be really proud of this robot.